I was all lives mattering to black coworkers. I was like, yo, like white people getting better. They're learning this and this and this. And so then, you know, one of my coworkers, Michaela, she just told me straight up. She was like, Stu, you don't got a damn thing to offer black people. As a young black man in the South, Dante Stewart saw dangers lurking for people who looked like him in America, as well as rewards for those who learned to blend into white spaces. And no space seemed more safe or more white than the Christian church he joined in college. Coming up out of the waters of baptism there, Dante envisioned leaving his blackness behind, leaving behind his boyhood baptism into black Pentecostalism, rising to a colorblind world where all lives matter. But as time passed, as he witnessed more bodies of black Americans being killed, he felt a rage growing inside, an unexpectedly holy kind of rage that prepared him for another baptism, this time by fire. And he came through it with something to offer black people and everybody else. Dante Stewart joins us to talk about his book, Shouting in the Fire, an American Epistle, in this episode of Fireside with Blair Hodges. Dante Stewart, thanks for joining me at Fireside today. Hey, great to be with you, Blair. We're talking about this book, Shouting in the Fire. It's a phenomenal book. You actually open it up by taking us with you to an August morning in 2020. And I think if we had like video footage of that moment, we'd see a guy walking down the stairs. It's morning time. It looks calm, peaceful. You're making coffee in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. And we'd see you reach over and grab this old King James version of the mm -hmm. Bible. It's black and it's got a rugged cover. It's, it's well loved, well used. And we might think to ourselves looking at this video, here's this religious man spending a quiet morning with scripture. It, it looks like a calm scene. But what you really describe there in the opening is on the inside, you say that chaos was ravaging your mm -hmm. mind and you felt a gnawing rage and a sadness mm -hmm. right there with the King James. What was happening here? Yeah. And first of all, thank you for having me on. And man, like it, it's, it's so much of what many people who are religious go through in general, you know, and it's just a lot of confusion. It's, it's a lot of questions that oftentimes doesn't yield the answers. Um, oftentimes, you know, the church is not on the side of making society better, but oftentimes the church it is on the side of making society worse. And so as I'm looking at 2020 and, you know, we're not just simply going through a moment in which George Floyd and others are murdered, particularly Breonna Taylor and Amal Arbery. We're not just going through a moment where they are murdered in very, uh, their murders are covered uh, uh, and their deaths are covered in very public ways. But we're going through a moment where Donald Trump is wreaking havoc within uh, so much of what people would deemed to be American religion. And, and that cut across the board, whether you was in white churches, whether you was in black churches. And of course, this was a particular problem in white churches. Donald Trump struck a chord with so many people and, and really called people to question faith and question what type of country we're in. But then also when I'm reaching for my Bible, I'm not even reaching for answers. I'm just reaching for stories. I'm reaching for things to keep me grounded in this moment where I feel as if once again, we're reminded that black lives don't matter. And I'm wrestling with this question of how am I going to walk out in the world as a young black dude, you know, inside of a church that's oftentimes on the bad side of history and trying to imagine something better, but also trying to do the work of a writer to chronicle the struggle, to chronicle better stories that I know that so many of us need. And so here I am in 2020 dealing with all of this and I'm sitting at my table. I'm at a moment where, you know, I just feel so down and discouraged about everything that's going on. And I'm just trying to find some words and I'm trying to find a way for really wrestling with the question. You know, what does it mean to be black and American and Christian and the ways in which oftentimes those realities and identities intersect in some of the most terrible ways possible? Yeah. And that's exactly what we meet right here at the front. And as you said, you're looking for stories in the Bible. You're looking for something you can see yourself in. So I wondered if you could read a passage from us from your book from page eight about what you found on this August morning in 2020. All right, cool. So yeah. So in in this moment, man, I'm thinking about, you know, my mama and the ways in which I was raised and, and how they prepared us, but also so much of what they did did not prepare us. So here I go. I think of my mother, the ways in which she would conjure up Old Testament stories, making dead bones come alive, turning and twisting words like lyrics from love songs. She loved telling a story about the three Hebrew boys in the fire, the three boys who endure unspeakable horrors, who had the audacity to live and dance and to shake off the chains was not just a good story. Their bodies, their struggle 
and they're surviving well it's my mama's own when i think about my mama how much she and all those black folk held on to old stories i don't just see people who courageously shook kingdoms and who preach audacious messages of liberation i also see people who know what it means to live with deep trauma and still love themselves enough to care and believe in their future i see them like the prophets trying to shake kingdoms and rock souls and straighten bodies back up again and love us in simple ways that cooled our bodies and cooled our spirits and stopped our trembling. To believe in better, to believe in your future, to shout in the midst of a country on fire, to stare down lions, to shake the foundations of the empire, to make meaning in the face of death, to fail, to create, to live, and to love. This is the stuff of hope. It is not an ascent to nostalgia or myths or lies. It is the audacious belief that one's body, one's story, and one's future does not end in this moment. The three Hebrew boys that my mama loved to talk about underwent two fires, a physical burning in a furnace and a prolonged burning set ablaze by empire. These boys didn't simply make it through the fire, somehow just embracing the violence of the empire politely and passively. The miracle was their audacity. The miracle was their courage to stare down terror. The miracle was the revelation that violent empires don't have the last say. Empires may be able to enslave our people, plunder our resources. They may try to destroy both our bodies and our future. But in the midst of the burning, we somehow try to liberate ourselves again and again, showing something more deep, more honest and more powerful than the blazing. Empires will not always win. Empires will not always win. Hmm. That is such a, a moving passage as you bring these biblical figures from ancient times right up to the present. And you point out that these boys didn't accept and embrace this violence politely and passively. Nice. That's a little foreshadowing of what we're about to hit. But before you got to this kitchen table, you walked a lot of miles to get to that kitchen Thanks. in 2020. And your book then brings us back to your childhood, South Carolina, 1990s. Yes. And there are different people back then that had different nicknames for you that kind of symbolized the fact that I feel like you were kind of trying to find out who you wanted to be back then. Give us a little bit of background about your childhood. Yeah. And I think I think for so many of us, particularly as young black folk, as I write about in the book, so many of us, you know, nicknames are not just, you know, symbols. Oftentimes they are destinies. And they, they're in, in many ways, they're destinies that oftentimes we want to run from. Mm. And so when I think about the nicknames that that I was named, some of them just was like, I hated being called vacuum boy by my daddy. Like it was the worst thing ever because <laughs> it just reminded me of like, oh, man, I got to always vacuum. I'm the one that always I'm playing a game right now and you want me to vacuum clean uh, and things like that. But then church boy always represented something that I always wanted to run from. Like, I didn't want to be associated with the Pentecostals that I grew up around. But then also the name of like Stu, where there was a difference. Like, my name is Dante. And oftentimes Stu is what people call me. And in my in, in my mind, as I look back on it now, Stu was something that other people created. Dante, who was who I really was. And my story from childhood all the way to today, really, is that struggling with the question who I am, especially looking at our country. Am I somebody who can walk in the fullness of my humanity? Am I somebody who can walk in the reality and the assurance that the same society that I'm living in, the same type of church that I'm experiencing will not be the same type of church that my son or my daughter will experience that like my son, as he walks in, walks in this, this world, I don't want my son to be like afraid that somebody would see him as a threat and try to blame him and shame him or ultimately kill him. I don't want my daughter to have to live in a country where for many black women, as Kiese uh, often say, you know, you have to work twice as hard for half as much where she's living in a society where to be black and to be woman is oftentimes to be doubly oppressed uh, the way that many feminists and women talk about. I don't want them to have to live in that society. And oftentimes, like when I'm wrestling with this identity, I'm wrestling and with these names and identity, I'm wrestling with the per who am I going to be amidst all these voices around me. And all these voices are demanding something different of me. They're all demanding something oftentimes that I don't even want to give. So even if you think about 2020 and all the way up into 2022, so much of this life and reality is facing the truth that there is so much demanded of us that far exceed our ability to give. 
And if we let it, so many things and so many people will exploit us and destroy us if we're not careful. And when I think about these nicknames, I think about how oftentimes they were prophecy. They, 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 they look forward to the ways in which I gave people myself in ways that were not helpful, that were not honest, that were not good. And oftentimes I failed in very many ways. And that's the thing about this story that, that I want people to gain from it. It's like, yo, I'm not the hero of the story. Oftentimes you meet me in, in, in so many ways where I felt myself, I failed other people. I failed uh, so much of this idea of faith, this idea of liberation, this idea of wholeness. But also, in many ways, it's a story of my courage and the way I find my way. But to find my way, I had to wrestle with who I became, who I was not, and what others tried to make me. Yeah, you bring up W.E.B. Du Bois, his idea of uh, double consciousness. This is the idea that black people in America grow up uh, seeing themselves, but also learning to see themselves as other people see them, especially as a predominant white culture sees them. And it, you've mentioned a few things like feeling like a black body is a threat, feeling like a black body is criminal. And black people, you talk about kind of grow up seeing themselves and seeing how other people see them. And I think double consciousness could be multiplied. And, and I think you show this throughout your book, which is you mm -hmm. saw yourself how uh, how your how the church saw you, how your parents saw you, how friends at school saw you. Facts. Um, and you were also trying to see yourself. And so I see this wrestle with identity a lot. What do you think as a child? You said you felt uncomfortable with that Pentecostalism. What did that religion look like? What was your faith of a child? Oh, bro. I mean, it's like tongue talking uh, <laughs> church all day. Uh, I, I remember back in high school when I played sports, you know, it's like it's like going to practice and then going to church, you know, all the time and then being tired and church for many of us young kids, you know, didn't represent a place to be liberated from. But it also times represented a place that that was like weird and represented loss. And so it wasn't for many of us, it wasn't like a cool thing to be associated with church in general, but Pentecostalism in particular, because uh, they always thought, you know, Pentecostals were like crazy. You know, they everything was about Jesus and everything was spiritual. And, you know, you just was uptight and just not a good person to be around because you always try to force your morality on other people and and very much the way i grew up with as a pentecostal it shaped like this idea of my own unworthiness and, and there's something woven into like christian theology where like we say this thing like no one is good and nobody can be good. And therefore, you know, we need to have some goodness from outside of us to make us good. I, I took that for granted for years and never really took into account that when you think that somebody else's humanity is not good, then you're always going to treat them bad. You're always going to treat them as less than. And when you're talking about the kind of multiple experiences and identities that I'm talking about in the book, particularly centered around the intersections of blackness and faith and citizenship and Americanness. When we thinking about those intersections, oftentimes that theology woven into what we think about citizenship, like no one can be good. Black people can't be good and therefore they must be controlled. You know, people, humans can't be good. Therefore, they must be controlled, you know, uh, uh, or or like the church uh, believe that those in the quote unquote world are not good. Therefore, the church can tr control. And I think whenever our theologies and our understandings of other people and ourselves is rooted in a, a belief in people's own unworthiness, then you will all, always treat them as if they're expendable. And we, we see this in this country when we when we look at. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. I want to particularly talk about Breonna Taylor and this kind of intersection of black women, society, and, and particularly thinking around the church. By the way, just to quickly remind people, this is the woman who was killed in her bed yeah. uh, at night because police came and, and were wrongly looking for someone else and ended up just shooting blindly into the into yeah, the facts. room so just to bring people up okay yeah 100 so, and so like when we think about like race Austin times we think particularly about black men and the way black men die uh and, and rarely if ever in and in, in, with the same energy and with the same conviction do we think about the ways in which black women and black lgbtq live and die and we would think about Breonna Taylor to talk about Breonna Taylor and the ways in which oftentimes she she was overshadowed by the deaths of two black men, Amar Arbery and George Floyd, 
tells the story about the way that we devalue people's humanity and 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 what we believe other people are worth. When we think about sexual assault and the way black women are treated in churches, like that's about what people believe other people are worth. And when we think about like Breonna Taylor and this kind of larger society, black women are not just mistreated, but oftentimes they die with nobody representing them or little to nobody representing them. Like when I thought about this story, like I wanted to figure out ways in which I can uncover or reveal continually alongside this long tradition of the ways in which we not just simply destroy people, but we try to erase them. And so this story is in some sense me taking back power for myself, but also for other people so that we would not be erased to so say that, yo, we're here. We have something to say and people need to take our reality seriously. And the way that you tell that story is through your own personal experiences. For example, you talk about how you were a walk on football player at Clemson University. And here you find yourself pulled kind of in two different directions. On the one hand, as a black person at a majority white school, you end up finding some refuge in gospel choir. So to hear that the black church experience was kind of difficult for you. It's interesting that when you got to university, you sought that companionship. You oh, went yeah, to gospel facts. choir, a little group you say of like 30 or so yeah. black Christians, but you're also invited to this Thursday night Christian fellowship, which is hundreds of people that, and <laughs> most of whom you refer to as quote, very nice white Christians. Right. So this is sort of like white Christianity on campus. And now you're pulled. Talk about that tension there at school. Yeah. So like black church for me, like it wasn't hard in the sense of like, 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 oh, this was the worst experience ever. But now looking in hindsight, I realized that there were so many limitations within the black church especially around wrestling with the Bible, wrestling with God, expanding our faith and making it a more progressive faith, like really trying to take into account marginalized voices. So like, yeah, when I think about black church, like it was good. Of course I wanted, like looking at hindsight, wanted it to progress and expand ideas about who count and who matter and, and what type of theology and conception of God we were embodying. Um, so I was always black church, even to this day, I'm very much still like Pentecostal. I'm very much, you know, I'm a, I'm a minister. I'm the tab global minister at, at, at a progressive black Baptist church here in Augusta, Georgia. And so when I went to Clemson, you know, being a drummer, I had a natural affinity with finding black spaces. That's just who I am. Uh, but also playing football at Clemson University, you know, you're living in this tension where oftentimes so many of us young black people who are raised in black churches or black church spaces or black social spaces go into these white spaces. And oftentimes, you know, we are invited to assimilate to their way. And so much of that assimilation is wrapped up in ideas that white is right and white is better and white is where we should go. Like gospel choir is good to like have fun with and express yourself musically. But white church is where you go to get your spirit fed and your mind fed and where you go to shape and form your life. And so it's subtle, but it's so powerful and so rooted in ideas of white supremacy that oftentimes so many of us, particularly black male athletes, we go into these spaces and we distance ourselves and devalue where we come from. So like I love playing the drums and I love going to gospel choir, but like where I went to go get fed and tried to help me think better about the world and my faith was oftentimes in white spaces. And so when I walked out that tension, in some sense, I failed at that tension because in the end, I was someone who believed that white churches were better. And over time, usually whatever space you're in, you know, is going to form how you think about God. It's going to form how you think about yourself. It's going to form how you think about other people. And when I looked around in this space, it was like bright lights, but dark ambience, uh, white people with acoustic guitars and things like that. And it is different. You even said like people would say to you, hey, oh, you're not like other black people. Oh, 100 percent. So like this, this whole idea is like people think that black people are problematic and wayward. When I think about Sadia Hartman's book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, I'm thinking in that language. Like she says that when people look at black people, all they see is disorder and they miss all the beauty. So this idea that you're not like them, quote unquote, is people thinking that black people are wayward or the problem or a threat, whatever ways people use to devalue us and disrespect us and demean us and ultimately destroy us and cut us off from so many opportunities, cut us off from so many things, cut us off from resources, cut us off from being visible. So it's like literal erasure. And many times this is not happening within the context of the larger society, quote unquote, 
but it is. But this right now, particularly, is happening in the context of church and religious space. The shocking thing to me was that instead of saying, well, what the heck is that supposed to mean? It meant something to you. Instead, you're like, hey, I, I am the exception. You actually started to kind of imbibe this a little bit. 100% because it felt good. Like it feels good to be celebrated and affirmed and to be praised. And so when you feel insecure and you come from places where oftentimes you are devalued, when you start to be affirmed by people, it feels good and you want more of it. So, uh, and, and if you think about being like an athlete, all, I was talking to one of my friends and, and we were talking about like performance and things like that and playing football. And he was like, you know, when I look back on our career, all we live for, for really all we live for was for coaches and other people to say, I see you good job. And that's just affirmation. All we live for is that affirmation. And so like when, when our parents and our folk from back home tell us like, there's nothing back here for you, you need to go out and get somewhere where you can make it. We start to believe that. And then we start to associate that this affirmation is us making it. This is what's going to make us successful. So instead of like leaning on the affirmation of where we come from, we oftentimes lean on the affirmation of white people. And that affirmation oftentimes come with power and protection. So like we'll get resources, we'll get money, we'll get deals, we'll get relationships, we'll get whatever through this affirmation and access. And oftentimes we don't really ask ourselves, what are we losing in the process? And that's really why I entitled the first chapter wages, particularly, you know, thinking about this white space, what we lose as black people in white spaces. And it's oftentimes there's always a cost and there's always a price to pay. And too often that price is our humanity sacrificed on the altar of white affirmation and praise. And with that, you started really identifying with all these white Christians, and you even decided then to join them, to be baptized, which you had been baptized as a, as a child. And now you're deciding, oh, that was wrong. I, I want to get in these white spaces. You were surrounded with white people that were affirming your humanity, telling you you're, that you're wonderful, really giving you a lot of love. And you decided to get baptized. And there's this passage here where it says, when you were baptized, this was perhaps the most emblematic moment of the way I learned to shut off parts of myself, lest I be that type of black person. It was the lessons of survival that we learned. So much depended on our ability to, as the Bible says, die daily. This is a fascinating moment here. You turn this baptism, you, it's the symbolism of baptism, but what's being buried in that water is like your blackness. Like you're Facts. trying to like crucify that blackness that's how you depict this facts facts and 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 for me like thinking about that section of the book it's like i'm thinking about like james baldwin and thinking about the ways in which baldwin uses religious terms to kind of talk about the ways in which society oftentimes just destroys us and so when people see us when people see like black folk oftentimes people see us as something to be like some type of marketing value, particularly us young black people inside of white spaces. We're marketable for white people to be seen as less racist, to be seen as more progressive. And so there is a death that w that happens and there is a death that we are invited into. But for me, like I went through two baptisms, well, really three baptisms. There was the baptism of my childhood. There was a the baptism of my blackness going into white spaces. But then there was also the baptism when I finally woke up and read Baldwin and it changed me and it shook me up so much to deal with the ways in which like I felt so many people in so many different ways, just simply because I wanted to be accepted by white folk. And it took time for you to get there because now yes. that you're in these white spaces, you're starting to, th to think of yourself as a Christian, not a black Christian. You're starting to th try to think of yourself as an American, not a black American. You, it's the kind of things that I hear from other white people when they're saying like all lives matter and Thanks. God doesn't see color. And you really were converted to that perspective. And so your religious views start to shift, your social views are shifting, and you depict yourself looking back on it. You say, you see, you were running from that blackness. You were running from something that felt scary. You were trying to run towards safety. And so yes. by the time Trayvon Martin was murdered, for example, mm -hmm. you're at university and you felt kind of distanced from it. Other players on your team are getting together to do something out of solidarity. Other black players are like getting together for a photograph and stuff. And you're just like, uh, no, 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 man. Like what was going on there for you? Yeah. So like in that moment, like if I'm a shooter, if I'm keeping a buck, like it was about me not wanting to lose what I felt like I had earned. Like I didn't want to lose that celebration and that affirmation and that protection. 
you know, because I felt like, yo, I deserved it. I earned it. So to identify with Trayvon Martin in that moment for me was like for many black athletes on college campuses where they say, you know, like, yo, like you're going to be a distraction and distraction is used as a way it's used as a weapon. Like it's used as a way to shut off black activism It's used as a way to stop black folk from asking questions of this community It's used as a way to protect white power It's used as a way to silence us. And so like, I'll never forget this story, you know, that, that was told, uh, by Anthony Reddy over in the UK. It's like this little passed down story that like this professor was given a lecture on blackness and God. And at the end of the lecture, it was question and answer time. And this young black dude stood up and was like, yo, I, I, I don't have a question. I just got a statement I want to make. When I became a Christian, I stopped being black. And so the crowd went into an uproar. And then the professor waited till the crowd got silent. And he simply asked, when did blackness become so bad that God must save you from it? And so when I think about that question, for me, mm. not identifying with Trayvon meant that I thought that like identifying with blackness was bad. And so the only choice was to run from it because it kept me from having to lose in the ways that many times we were warned when we go off to white college campuses, we were warned not to lose. Mm. And so I had to be straight. I had to make sure I go to class. I had to make sure I made no mistakes uh, because ultimately like our folks was really mainly concerned about us making it and who could blame them. Who really could blame them in, in a society that they grew up in that they wanted uh, their children to experience a world that was much different but in the process so many of us ended up trading in what they had experienced and had known to be so true particularly that this society and, and many other institutions in this society oftentimes struggle to love us that what they knew most true of that inability to love we oftentimes sacrificed it in order for us you know, to progress in ways that, you know, that they did not. Mm. And so when we did do it, we thought that we were better than them in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we distanced ourselves from them. But then like when I think about Trayvon, it wasn't like George Floyd, because in that moment, people wasn't really thinking about, I mean, in, in a larger society, black folk have always, you know, been been standing in solidarity with black folk and talking about, you know, police and vigilante violence. Uh, it's just that large society just haven't been hearing and Trayvon woke so many people up. But for me, it would take years and years and years before I ever would be woken up to the ways in which like this distance was destroying me. Yeah. You talk about how things started to shift for you when you learned about another murder. So all these all these murders keep happening, being put up on social media and being talked about publicly. And this was when you learned about the murder of Alton Sterling and you were on your way to Bible study with white people. You were going to white church, you, you call it, you're, you're ready for Bible study and you see this footage and something something cracked open for you. And it seems like this was another conversion experience for you. And Talk about that moment because you say that you wanted to express anger and grief. You, so you still went to Bible study, mm -hmm. but you also say that you wanted to stay safe and committed to white Christians. How were you negotiating that at that Bible study? At this moment, I, like I was fully sold on the lie. You know, I was fully sold on the lie that whiteness was right. And so like I was preaching, teaching and leading in these white spaces and I was actually comfortable. This was years and years and years of being socialized and disciple that these were the people that I should be around. And so I fully invested in that identity. Like I was not wrestling with it. I was not trying to run from it. Like I was OK with it because it brought so much affirmation. It brought me into places that I never would, quote unquote, imagine. And then when Alton Sterling is murdered and Philando Castile is murdered and then Donald Trump happens, I'm preaching, teaching, leading in this white church. And I'm I'm the young black charismatic dude who's told, you know, yo, you should lead this uh, group through this book by this white man. So I, I was like, all right, cool. Like, yeah, like I'm, I'm leading, you know, is what I want to do. I want to be in ministry. I'm leading. And so then I'm leading this group, man. But then, you know, like this is the first time in life, like even playing football, like it wasn't the case because like football is still in very much ways like segregated. You stay with your, your people. We're going to stay with our people. But this time at this moment was the first time that I really started like living around white people. And I was engaged in conversations and heard things that they, you know, never would have told us, even though people would say it in public, but like they talk differently around themselves, particularly like 
about the ways they think about like the characters and the stereotypes of of black folk uh like saying oh george floyd's a drug yeah, addict facts. Or, like like or, like trayvon whatever, blah, martin blah, blah, blah. like alton sterling or philando castile deserved it like yeah. he shouldn't have, if he was doing the right thing then he wouldn't have been murdered should have complied yeah, yeah exactly and, 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 and then like you know like even even going further to say like especially when it came to like christianity like black people got nothing to offer there, there was this one situation where people in the group shared this thing where this person was saying like there would be no black christians without white people wow like white people were the reason why they were black christians everything about the society and about the church told them that whiteness was right and that whiteness was pure and whiteness was divine and whiteness was sacred and you heard them saying the stuff with with you there yeah, facts thinking that you're going to be like yeah of course no, no, because and, like a no, good black very, person would say no, that in very right? many would, ways i did say that like in very many ways i was like yeah, of course i went along yeah. with it i didn't make no noise i went along with it mm. but then it was as i started to deal with philando and 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 alton sterling and then you know my wife uh who who really you know showed me who i was in very many ways i, I this was a painful part dante i yeah, have to say this part a, of the yeah. book shook me a bit yeah yeah bro it was it, it was tough because i came from work I was like, I, in this moment, I was like, yo, we need to be unified. Like, You were trying to all lives matter to black coworkers, facts, right? Basically. Facts. <laughs> I was all lives mattering to black coworkers. I was like, yo, like white people getting better. They're learning this and this and this, this and that. And so then, you know, one of my coworkers, Michaela, she just told me straight up. She was like, Stu, you don't got a damn thing to offer black people. Mm. And I'm like, damn, like. Like I really thought, like yo, I'm, I'm, I, like I knew I was black. I'm a black dude. Like I'm trying. I, I'm, I feel like I'm black and things like that. You know, things, and I'm wondering, like, okay, what does she mean by that? So I'm angry. I'm wrestling with that. Then I come home, and I tell my wife, and I'm griping with her, and she tells me, "You're always listening to other people when I've been telling you this the whole time." And man, it gutted me. Mm. It gutted me because at the end of the day, I saw myself for who I was. And I write this in the book that I had loved white people more than I love my black wife. And I love white people more than I love black people. I love white people more than I actually cared about us dying. And Dante, I want to be clear too, because when you say like you love white people, what, what I hear you loving was the white perspective of black people being less than. Facts. And sort of buying into that ideology. And by doing that, you had already been sort of distanced from your wife because she was reacting to these killings yeah. and all the all the things that were going on differently than you were. And you were just sort of floating along and you depict her as just sort of being devastated and, and struggling it alone. And now she has this moment where, wow, she just tells you what what she had seen. And like, Dante, I, I, I kind of agree with them about what you're doing. And that's your wife. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and that thing and that thing. <laughs> that's so yeah, hard. It, it, was, it was tough, bro, because. You know, it's one thing to face what other people are saying, but it's it's another thing to face the truth of those you love most, what they saying, and you having to deal with yourself in very honest ways. When you're alone, when you're by yourself, when nobody is around anymore, you got to deal with that. And a part of this book that was so hard to write about was dealing with the ways in which I failed in such public and terrible ways. And that, that was something about the way I wanted to write others in my story, bro. Like I had to tell the truth about about them in ways that gave them agency. Like I could I couldn't just tell this story as if like I was the hero of the story. Like I needed people to understand like so many of us become this way. Yeah, it's confessional. Yeah. So many of us become this way and so many of us suppress it. And so many of us hurt others in the name of it. And by the way, I'd say these are the black voices that a lot of white voices want to hear from. Facts. These are the people that say things that white people have already said. They white people like myself didn't want to be challenged by black people. We wanted to hear black people saying things we already believed. And there are plenty of black voices in the media today who are willing to do facts. that. Facts, facts. That's a challenging part of it, bro. Especially in telling this story because it's like this story is such a real story that you're just going to have to sit with. It's much like heavy, like, and that was one of the books that like, like I was reading. Yeah, it's K.S.A. Yeah, Layman's yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. It was just like heavy by K.S.A. Layman and, and Men We Reap by Jasmine Ward. And even like the Yellow House by Sarah Broom, there's such visceral and honest stories about the ways in which people fail at love, the ways in which people fail at being whole, the ways that people fail at being free. But then also, it's also a story about the way people 
get better and mature and change. And this story doesn't end just simply at the ways I fail. It is a story also about the ways that I change. And that's that's part of one of the main stories that I want to tell and want people to, to know is that like, yeah, this is what I became. But this is how black people, particularly black women, save my life. This is how they made me change. You also talk about how you started reading books. In fact, it was a white guy at church, yeah. this person named Drew, yeah. who recommended that you read Dr. Martin Luther King's book. And you say you'd never even read a book by a black person yep. before. So there's this white guy recommending this and you start reading James Baldwin. And it, it seems like you're kind of on a trajectory out of Christianity. It would seem that you might connect with a lot of these voices and find your way out. But instead, you, you're also returning to the Bible, too. There's a passage I hope that you would read on page 92 here where – you're reprocessing your Christianity. You're reprocessing what it means to be American, what it means to be black in response to the things that you described happening with your wife and all this. So let's read that passage there on page 92, if you will. Yeah, for sure. So around that time, I was reading the book of Nehemiah for the first time in my life. I realized that someone in the Bible was angry. My Christianity up until that point had neither room nor language to talk about the ways rage could be a fuel for love and a balm for healing. Christians were not to be angry or enraged at the terrible things going on around us. Christians were meant to just love. And that love never meant marching on the streets, testifying in the halls of Congress, preaching audacious messages of liberation from pulpits. Calls for unity were an excuse for silence in the face of Christian complicity and abuse, injustice and disrespect. Jesus had been weaponized to keep us silent about white supremacy and anti-blackness. That Jesus... I had to get rid of him. The sanitized version of Nehemiah's story where the rage that he spoke of was seen more as a misunderstanding than a spiritual necessity. I had to get rid of. I started to read his story as my story. My story is his story. The people in the Bible were not just distant figures. They were those who knew the struggle of oppression, fighting for your personhood and the ever complex relationship with God in the midst of struggle. I, like James Cone, began to read the Bible through the lens of black power, black arts, and the black consciousness movement. Nehemiah, for me, had become not just a glorified spiritual leader, but a revolutionary. He had become my Fred Hampton. I pulled out my journal, grabbed my gel pen, and wrote Nehemiah's Rage, Set Them Free. This resonated with me in the sense of also feeling like rage couldn't be a Christian virtue. Christianity is supposed to be kind and happy and smiley and all of these things. And you're finding in the Bible this rage and you're shifting this idea of rage, the possibility of rage as being something that could be holy, that could be sacred, that could be affirming, that could be powerful, that could be godly. And that's a big shift. Was Talk about that shift for you and it seems like that'd be a scary shift because, man, I imagine there was probably a lot of rage that needed to be expressed at that point. No, facts, bro. Like, and, and that was the thing, like, on, on the real, like, that was the hardest part is, is I'll never forget. I was actually supposed to go on staff at that white church. And I'll never forget the pastor having lunch with me and telling me that, yo, hey, something came up and, we, and we're not able to bring you on staff. And then after that, he was like, yo, we was talking and we believe race becoming too much in your life. And just thinking about the audacity of a white Christian man in the South telling me a young black person that race is becoming too much in my life. When everything about this church, most of the things are about race, particularly the ways in which white people embody white supremacy and try to erase us and make us silent. And so, like, when I tell you I was angry, like I'm still angry in many ways for the things that not just me, but so many black people endured in that space, particularly black women who was around me in that space. I'm thinking about our friends who, who was living with us in that church space where, you know, I was enraged at the ways in which they blamed us. I was enraged at the ways they didn't include us. I was enraged at the ways they used us. And so like I needed a place to take my rage. I needed a place to broaden my understanding of theology. I needed a better theology. I needed a better tradition. And for me, leaving that space, I couldn't just leave that space. I had to leave their God. So in some ways, whatever ideas of Christianity I had when, when I was around them, I had become a non-Christian in their eyes. 
I did not want their Christianity, just like James Cone did not want the Christianity of white people. Just like Katie Cannon, the black woman, the theologian, did not want the, the, the Christianity of white people and the Christianity that of black men who oftentimes made black women invisible. I'm thinking about black feminists. They did not want the faith of white people and of the terrible ways we black people embody the same type of faith as white people. I'm thinking of James Baldwin, who did not want the faith of Christianity in general, but wanted to embody a better faith that took seriously developing a better a theology that loved black people that actually looked at black life and black art and black creativity as sacred and divine and something that we can use and that something that we can find God in and something that we can find ourselves in. And I think, I think oftentimes back to this conversation that Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin had where Nikki Giovanni tells the story of her being at this event. And she tells the story of being at this event where a protest was happening, I think. And she was in this moment where, or it might be a, a celebration and the choir was singing. Uh, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And she said, everybody started shouting and it hit her that at the end of the day, even as a black militant and revolutionary, that all she had to offer in that moment was Jesus. And she's not just simply talking about a theology. She's talking about a way of mm -hmm. being in the world. And this is a theology. It's a better theology than many of the ways that people practice their faith. And then James Baldwin stops her and tells her, baby, what we did with Jesus was not supposed to happen. And for me, mm. I wanted to lean into that. I needed a better theology. And that theology meant turning to black people because black people saved my life and saved me and made me something that I never would have imagined. And that was somebody who like Toni Morrison says, was able to grow up black one more time. Mm. And that's the story that you tell in this book. I also wanted to ask, as you started to revisit and rethink rage as a religious impulse, has rage since then ever backfired for you? What are some ways yeah. that rage can go wrong? Because yeah. I think you make a strong case that rage is there in the Bible. Rage can be mm -hmm. a religious principle. It can be mm -hmm. uh, a call for justice. What about the underside of rage? Some of the dangers of rage? Yeah, 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 yeah. So like one of the things and this kind of like moving beyond many of those spaces I was in, one of the things I started to realize is like rage and like bitterness and lack of creativity and art are like correlated in, in very like legitimate ways. I'll never forget, listen to a conversation between James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and Baldwin was talking to her and he was like, yo, like if you're always resisting, then you cannot create art. And I took that very seriously. Like he wasn't saying that like our anger, our rage is a bad thing as, as it relates to morality, but he was challenging or in some sense, inviting us to kind of think deeply and critically about uh, how the anger is stewarded, to use that language, or, or where where is that anger directed? Because I, I, I want to lean away from- Yeah, where you channel yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, where you channel it. So I want to lean away from like thinking about rage and morality standpoint, because I feel like that completely shuts down the conversation. It kind of moves us away from thinking about the usefulness of our emotion. Now, I'm even thinking about my Aisha Cherry, my homie. I wish I had her book when I was writing this chapter, and I felt like- like as I've re been reading the book and wrestling with the book, like I felt like it would have made what I was saying even stronger, but also living in the tension of this question. Like what about rage backfiring and what it does to us? And she's in some sense trying to think about rage in the context of anti-racist struggle, but particularly through the language of Audre Lorde. And so much of Audre Lorde's understanding of rage and where it goes, she's not trying to get us to think about morality as much as she's trying to get us to think about what are we creating in our anger or Baldwin, what are we creating in our anger? So for me, as I'm thinking about the backfiring rage, I'm thinking about how oftentimes when I'm just simply resisting with no alternative, either alternative spaces or alternative ways of thinking about the world, alternative ways of being in the world or alternative uh, uh, ways of creating art and, and getting better and maturing, then I'm always centering and reminded of those who harm me. And so therefore, instead of this kind of deep transformation, instead of those silences being broken, I'm being reminded of the ways in which people made me silent by their actions and their power. So to allow that not to backfire 
means that I have to channel that rage into creating the art that makes us seen and love and embrace and protect it. And, and, and you know, I was actually recently asked about this in a conversation. Uh, somebody asked me, you know, why do we all need to press into like rage, resilience and remembrance as kind of ways to think about true racial equality and equity? And I, 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 I correct them. I was like, yo, for starters, I don't think we can even reach like, quote unquote, true racial equity in our time in this moment. I mean, is that pessimistic? Yes, indeed. But as we look at history, history has not given us any evidence to believe such an audacious claim. Yeah, especially, is it pessimistic or is it like based on the reality? Yeah, facts, facts. I would say it's real. You're just trying to be a realist. Yeah, yeah, I'm just being yeah. kind of realistic uh, or, 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 or whatnot. But like if we look at history and look at it from the perspective of our black story, and thinking about us and the ways in which we use these things or even the ways they backfire, it does tell the story that black life is more than just trying to reach a point where others will accept us or and really more about the ways we live and accept ourselves even as we push back against this anti-black world or even the ways in which we harm ourselves as individuals and harm one another as interpersonal communities. Uh, and I think about that backfiring of rage as like that language becomes exploited and, and it almost is, is characterized about, okay, like rage is good. Therefore, like let's reach true equality rather than saying, okay, like I don't want it to be characterized like that. I want it to be about you know, how we stay tapped into like our own humanity. You know, how do we flesh out our lives as ways, not just thinking about our rage or our emotions as for other people, but being tapped into our own stories that give us meaning that allows us to express the full range of our emotions. So stay tapped into it, but realize like that is not the only expression of our humanity, or we shouldn't just simply be reduced to what makes us angry or, or, or what we're responding to or resisting. Um, but we have other emotions, love, uh, uh, vulnerability, uh, fear, uh, joy, just a range of kind of emotional re experiences uh, that can also characterize our lives. That reminds me of something you wrote here. This is on page 97. It says, I began to see that being enraged becomes dangerous when it's not channeled through love, mm -hmm. serious, deep love for ourselves and our neighbor. Mm -hmm. So you're, you depict it as a dance. You say love dancing with rage, rage dancing with love mm -hmm. becomes the greatest spiritual, moral, and political task in each generation. Facts, facts, facts. And I, and I think, you know, of, yeah, I think of the tradition that I'm writing into, you know, this black writerly tradition that tried to link, you know, what makes us angry and what makes us feel loved. And you can't really have, you know, our full humanity without it either, because you got to be realistic. We can't always change what makes us angry. And that's just a fact of life. We can't always change what makes us angry or this kind of external kind of world we're living in or the external factors of our lives. But what we can do is even as we are responding to or living inside of a context of things that make us angry, we need not forget to tap into what we already are beyond the logics of this space. So like I'm thinking about when I left white churches or when I think about the ways in which uh, this country harms black life or devalues us. So much of the narrative woven in my book, as the epigraph said, here you were to be loved, to be loved, uh, to ever strengthen you. Uh, against a loveless world. So when Baldwin is talking to his nephew in this context, and even when I'm writing my book, weaving these narratives of my grandma, my grandfather, my mother, my sister, my brother, my uncle, um, just black literature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm trying to hold on to is the things, the things that we offer to the world and the ways in which we've uh, took menial things and, and made it so much. The ways in which we live within the context of what made us angry, but also what made us feel loved. I went back home the other day. Uh, actually, uh, what, what that would have been yesterday. Uh, actually, yeah, it would have been yesterday. I went back home yesterday, spoke at my auntie's funeral who tragically passed uh, the other week um, and, and, and spoke. At, I'm sorry to hear uh, that. Yeah, yeah, bro. It's been it's been crazy. Over the last three weeks, I've lost three family members. Mm. Uh, one aunt, my grandfather, uh, who who's in the book. Uh, that people will read about and my auntie, his, his sister-in-law. 
Uh, and I, I went I went home after speaking at this funeral and I went to my granddaddy's uh, room. And as I'm there, my grandmother's there, my aunts are there and they're looking through the old things that granddaddy owned. Then my aunt calls me over here. She's like, Dante, if you want any of these books, like, yo, get one of these books. And it's a, it, it, on the shelf. It's like old school books. I mean, like old school books, they're like very old. You could tell they're worn, they're read through, they're old, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. They smell old. Yeah, they smell old. They look old. They feel old. And so she said, these are the books your granddaddy had. In the context of these books, there's a journal that my granddaddy wrote in and multiple journals actually. There's a journal where granddaddy wrote down names, numbers, bills, conversations, etc. There's another journal where granddaddy wrote down scriptures and his own little thoughts on the scripture. Then to the right and to the left of the journal, you have a book on the history of Western civilizations. You have a book on Great Britain. You have a book on law. You have a book on mathematics and geometry and, and oh, it's on, on applied mathematics. And I'm like, I asked grandma, I was like, oh, like, granddaddy really read all these books? And she said, yes, he read them all the time. And when I thought about that, bro, like, and I think about like my granddaddy and the life that my granddaddy lived in the context of him being born in the 30s. Um, being aware of the 40s, being aware of the 50s, being aware of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way uh, to the 2015, 16, 17, uh, until dementia really took his mind and his memory. My granddad was viscerally aware of all of this and did something about it. He went and made sure that people knew their rights. He went and he made sure that people were voting. When when my granddad's funeral was happening, people were offering reflections. They was like, if, if, if there was an issue with black folk in these rural communities, Ruben was going to be there to tell people that they couldn't treat black people like this. And he was there to do something about it. But then here is this man doing all these things in public, but also being so deeply concerned about our lives that he feels like everything is recordable. That for me, bro, is like the living the love, even in spite of what makes us feel angry and what hurts. It is that there are so many aspects of our lives that's worth loving, that's worth recording and worth remembering. What would he say and what would you say to people who want to say, oh, but look at all the progress. Like your <laughs> grandfather was lived through segregation. He lived through yeah, failure thanks. of reconstruction. He saw the civil rights movement. He saw Dr. King. Mm -hmm. And now look how wonderful. Isn't everything wonderful? What's your response to that when people say, well, hey, you know, yeah, maybe racism's still kind of around, but aren't you glad this is that we've come hey, so far? Bro. Hey, I'm going to just keep it 100, bro. Like to look at anybody black over the age of, 50 <laughs> and to tell them look how far we come is audacious at best malicious at worst mm. when, when people speak of progress um and, and i write about this in a book that too often times like people speak of progress in in the perspective of white people and the gaze that we look at life through is gonna determine how we talk about the life we live. If we look at somebody, and I was literally just talking to Cassie about this, and we were grieving this, like legit grieving, the reality of our grandparents. His grandmother's just a few years, 10 years older than my granddaddy. I'm almost positive I think his grandmother's like 92, 93, something in that area. My granddaddy, a bit younger. And both of them, and even my grandmother, who is very much in her right mind, is going to be 90 this year, very much in her right mind. And you look at these older black folk and you see all that they have seen and you see all that they have gone through. They have to have the same conversations with us, their children, their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. The same conversations they were having in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. If you say progress has been made, 
we can say yes on one level. There's nuance in that conversation. There is progress, but there is no reason to praise and to be triumphal because at the end of the day, my granddaddy and so many black people die in, in biblical terms without ever receiving the promise of full citizenship without ever being given what they actually would do. <laughs> These people clean white folks laundry. <laughs> These people were forced into jobs that white people forced them into. These people did not retaliate the ways white people retaliate against us just for simply being human and existing as free and, and existing as people who just wanted to create life and build life beyond what they were trying to, what others were trying to give to us. These people did not do that. These people always believed the best about people who failed to believe the best about us. Hmm. And when I think about progress, I think about my granddaddy, my grandmother, and I say, yo, the only answer to that is to feel our hands. Look at our feet. Listen to our stories. What progress? But then, you know, on the other hand, the whole conversation about progress is, you know, we don't think I, I, I ain't at least think about progress. I'm not I'm not very concerned about progress because in some sense, progress in this in the context of this conversation is almost about how others can make better decisions about our lives. Hmm. That's, that's really when, when people start talking about progress. That's what they're really talking about. How can white people start making better decisions in society about black lives? So like progress is, okay, we had a black president, okay? Black people are in these jobs. This all is in the context of white power structures, white decision makers. Yeah, it's interesting. Like the fact that we're even talking about it in terms of progress su yeah, suggests 100. the ongoing continuing problem and yeah, balance, imbalance of and power. It's like, yeah. And, and lack of justice. Like, so yeah, it's like, they're not segregating bathrooms right now, Facts. but there are de facto segregations yeah, happening between communities. There's there's de facto segregation in the way that community resources are spent and the way that black people have been denied access Facts. to generational wealth because Facts. of zoning policies that prevented them from getting bank loans and things that, that white families were able to. So it just goes on and on. And I agree. One of the things that frustrates me the most when I hear friends and wh white people in particular talk about, well, we should really focus on the progress is it, it becomes an exercise in thinking we've made it already. It becomes uh, an exercise in self-congratulation and an opportunity to think that, oh, that also that we don't have to really do much because apparently progress just kind of happens. No, uh, 100%. <laughs> no, 100. Like, I think about the conversations that we, we continue to have. I'm talking about my grandma. Like I never forget writing an essay on when me and my grandma looked at Amanda Gorman, give her poem at the inauguration. And my grandma was like, yo, this like phenomenal. She got it, bro. Yeah, yeah. Even if people don't like respect her like that, you know, she, she, she really do got it. Like, like, you know, she got the art and she in the tradition. Um, and she one of us, um, and she got it. So, you know, I was talking to my grandma, bro. And like, I, I, my grandma said something, I mean, we, we was laughing over this joint and, and my grandma was like, yo, like, like, like they need to show everybody this moment, you know? And she was like, nah, I done seen some things in, in my 80 plus years of life. And she was like, I ain't never, you know, uh, seeing anything like this. And she was like, she's talking about this context where like, I can't believe I done seen all these things. She kept repeating that. And, and she talking about this rut, like we've been in a rut, uh, the way black folk talk about, you know, we messed up, we in a messed up country. Uh, we've been a, in a rut, but she, she, she looked with, with so, so much pride in Amanda Gorman. And I think about this whole kind of idea of progress, bro. It's like, what are the things people have to continually talk about that hurts? And that what makes us proud. I'm thinking about like, like that's the norm. That should be the norm. You know, that should be the norm. But then, you know, on the one, on, on another hand, it's like, you know, my grandma got to be reminded, like, even in that, there are still names of people beyond Amanda Gorman's moment 
that my grandma who looks at the news religiously, she she's my grandmother is tapped into newspapers, keeping up with the times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The times as in the context, not the actual New York Times, but keeping up in the times and things like that. And she 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 has a, a, a very intimate knowledge with all of this. And I think, you know, like like, like yeah. progress is, is about what we make and what we have made and what we have done in spite of uh, or whatnot. But then we have to talk about progress in the context of what we still have to grieve over and over and over and over again. Like what's crazy is this in the same in the same city that George Floyd's that George Floyd was murdered in a mere lock is murdered in in the same way that Breonna Taylor is murdered. The no knock warrant. Think yeah. About they no not warrant. Mm -hmm. Same city as George Floyd, same context as Breonna Taylor. But then 2020 done passed, all these businesses done read, read their books, they done made their declarations. But then it's the structural realities. It's the it's the power to which people have over our lives. That's the problem. And that's the enduring problem. Mm -hmm. As people read through your book, Dante, they're going to see you go on this journey. And as I'm reading and following along, you are journeying through your faith. So you've you kind of left the faith of your youth. You came to to join mm -hmm. white Christianity, predominantly white uh, Christianity, and then you that became uncomfortable, became untenable for you. You ended up leaving, and so a reader might expect your trajectory to just continue right out of Christianity. You you'd left sort of the black church mm -hmm. of your youth. You had this really negative experience in white Christianity. So we might expect mm -hmm. you to just sort of exit, but you didn't. And I'm interested to hear mm -hmm. you talk about why that is. You're still a Christian today and what that looks like and why there wasn't an exit at that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. First and foremost, I want to say like those who do exit, I, I don't want to like let my journey be like a kind of story of like, yo, like, yo, y'all need to stay. Uh, you know, some people will exit and some people need to exit. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that. Like, I, I want to say like, like I salute those who be like, yeah, nah, this ain't for me. This ain't this ain't the thing. This ain't it. Um, and I and I want to live in that reality that 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 always is is understanding that like my identity is a meaningful identity, but not a totalizing identity. Yeah, and I want to add, like, your book makes that clear too. Like that comes through. Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. Because I feel like a lot of times when people start talking about like even like faith deconstruction or talk about like growing in your faith or giving up faith or things like that. Oftentimes it's like, well, like this ain't like leaving Jesus. Well, you know, some people do, you know, and that's okay. And, 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 and we need to be okay living in that reality. Um, the reason why I stayed though, is, is very much a reflection of just my love of, of, of womanist thought and theology, um, as well as black traditions of black liberation theology, but also the larger black literary tradition. I'll start with womanist theology, and I'm particularly thinking about uh, Reverend Dr. Renita Weems. I always call on her name uh, because I want people, not only just Renita Weems, but M. John Copeland, Emilia Towns, Katie Cannon, and, and so many more, you know, black women who, Wilda Gaffney, who, who shaped me and, and shaped my own understanding of myself. But particularly Reverend Dr. Renita Weems, I was reading a uh, paper that she gave at a conference on theology. And the question was asked, you know, why she hasn't left the black church or left the church altogether or gave up the Bible. And she simply answered that I don't want to cut myself off from the conversation uh, that black women been having with the Bible before me to think about this sacred text as something that can be liberating from the ways in which, you know, racism, sexism, patriarchy, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and all the likes are woven into theology and destroy and disrespect and devalue other people. She said, I didn't want to be cut off from the ways in which black women were wrestling with the text and centering their lives at the intersection of black womanhood, of faith and the larger society that they lived in. But then she responded about the church. She said that I knew that there were still so many black women to be, to be made free. And when I, when I read Dr. Weems is, um, thoughts on this question but then also james cone when he talks about you know how he found out that the black christian experience can be a liberating experience i also realized that like for me between these womanist theologians and black liberation theologians that they had something to say that was beyond the white logic and the white experience and the white gaze of faith that there was something central 
to our experience of our own humanity, to our experience of ourselves, that was worth centering. That black life is as much a starting point to think about your faith as any other person's perspective. That our context, that our history, that our bodies, that our that our religion, that that whatever we offer and bring to the world is worthy of study, is worthy of communicating, is worthy of receiving as to use the language, just kind of academic language, is worthy of being received as an epistemology for to, to help us name, see, and act within the world. And so as I sat with them um, and really sat with them in some messy seasons of my life and sat with them in the midst of transition, a long transition, I started to realize that over time, as I started to encounter woman's thought and black feminism and then black literature, I started to be given a framework to understand and broaden my faith, uh, to not see Christian faith as a way of uh, uh, power and control. But I started to see and reread these narratives as ways to liberation and love that I started to realize that, yo, if I'm the only one benefiting from my language of liberation, of my language of faith and, and my language of inclusion, um, if I as a black a uh, straight man is the only one uh, benefiting from that language of liberation that I'm doing something wrong. And, and, and my ideas of liberation is actually, you know, exploitation because it's utilizing yeah. this beautiful language, this beautiful experience simply to benefit myself. It's self aggrandizement. Yeah. 100%. And so faith and liberation and understanding of being alive and being human, you know, has to be intersectional. I have to encounter other people's experiences. I have to be able to stand in the world alongside them even if their experience is not my experience i say my experience is my experience yours experience is your experience and there is a mutual love that can be had a mutual learning a mutual compassion that can be had when we bring what we offer to the table but then the main reason why i did not you know altogether leave per se is i really do I really think as, as Dr. Weems said, you know, that, you know, there's so many, so many more that can be free within the black church. And, you know, my, my upbringing is black church. I am hella churchy. I, I am very much still. <laughs> they Pentecostal. called you church boy or whatever. Uh, what was it? What was yeah, the nickname? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. They called I you? Am, yeah. Church boy, church <laughs> yeah. boy. I am still very much a church boy. Uh, I am still very much tied to the church and still very much. And when you, when you hear me talk, when you see me, write, When you feel me, you sh when you see me kind of and feel me show up in the world, you know, there are, th there are going to be things that's very familiar to black church life. Uh, but one of the things that, that Baldwin taught me, that's why I kind of talk about Jesus and James Baldwin. One of the things Baldwin taught me is that there is a way to critique the church as well as remain within it. Even though Baldwin left the church, you know, there are very many ways in Baldwin's literature mm -hmm. that the church did not leave him. And in actuality, mm -hmm. Baldwin was closer to church than many of the black and white Christians were mm -hmm. that he criticized. Mm -hmm. So when Baldwin would say, you know, that that if the, the concept of God has any validity, it can only make us larger, more beautiful. And if it cannot do this, then we it's time for us to get rid of him. He is not only talking about the language that we think about God, you know, but the ways in which we utilize that language to think about ourselves. He links our theology with our living. And so Baldwin is not saying, yo, like, leave this, you know, but he wants to make it better because he understands it, this institution, whatever it is, can grow and be better. And it's a meaningful part of life, if it, even if it's not the total part of life. But then Baldwin would also say that there is not a ethos or a pathos not like those black tire will be souls declaring the goodness of the Lord. So he saw something meaningful in the ways in which the church and our expanding of this idea of church, even now in this moment, when black people are expanding ideas of spirituality and we kind of doing this as human beings in general, we're being more syn syn uh, syn uh, syncretist, like syncretic, and being able yeah. to, 
yeah, yeah, syncretic. Not, thank you. I was looking for that term. We're being more syncretic and we we're taking on things and we're we're taking pieces of others along the way. Uh, we're taking things from like the black arts movement or, or, or black culture and black art, but we're also able to look at Islam and we're also able to look at Africana religions and we're also able to look at Buddhism and we're also able to look at indigenous knowledge and forms of life and thinking about the land, the body and the divine and we're trying to figure out how to move and maneuver in this world together. And so when I think about Baldwin and the ways in which Baldwin positioned himself in the world, especially within his queerness, uh, his black queerness, it's like there are things about the church I cannot be a part of. But Baldwin in his black queerness, in his faith, in his expanding ideas of God, in his love of the beauty of black life, in the ways he was looking at the everyday power of black people and, and saying that there's something sacred and divine and, and meaningful within this reality, in this love, in this being alive. I do believe that Baldwin was actually church wherever he went. You know, there like who could who could not look at that video in meeting the man? You know, and, and, and listening yeah. to Baldwin talking to the students and saying, you know, I, I can't lead a movement, but I can't F up your mind, you know, and, <laughs> and then him start laughing in that context and all of them laughing about this. And it's like an, ir an irony and it's yeah. like love and it's like joy, it, even as he's talking about this and joking, uh, but also being real. He was being that type of person that was enjoyable to be around that made us better. Um, and if that's not faith, then I don't know what it is. That resonates with me so deeply. I think that this is what prophethood is to me is the and this is the genius mm -hmm. I think of Christianity is that yes, it's been used to oppress. Yes, it's been used to exploit. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's been used to advance the sword. Uh, it in so many ways has failed. But inside of it, there are these seeds of possibility. There are these elements within Christianity that can turn on mm -hmm. all of the bad things that Christians and Christianity has done and call it to something higher. And we see this in the Hebrew Bible as mm -hmm. well. This is what Judaism is about. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, our Jewish mm -hmm. sisters and brothers can teach us is that, that to be a prophet is to be able to be honest about one's own culture, mm -hmm. about one's history, and call mm -hmm. it to something better in love. Mm -hmm. And Facts, this is what 100%. I'm hearing you describe as you describe James Baldwin. And I agree with you that he's he's a, f a thoroughly religious person who could not be religious because it was not allowed. Uh, and so he was religious Facts. in his own Facts. way. And I love that you preface Facts. this whole section by saying there are people who have – uh, departed from religion or been pushed out of Christianity who nevertheless maintain a spirit of prophecy and maintain a call mm. to me as a believer, as a, as a religious person that serves as the role of a prophet to me. And, mm. I, and I see that in your work. I see it in the people that you're inspired by. Um, and and it, it, man, it, it really energizes me. It takes me to this idea of hope. And you kind of conclude mm -hmm. with with a meditation on hope and here's a quote from you you say this and this is a really important caution about hope that i love that you put in here this 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 really stood out you said offering hope and meaning is a profoundly human task but it's a profoundly harmful task when it always tells an optimistic story so i want to focus on that before we go about mm -hmm. what hope is to you mm -hmm. and how we do that without just saying oh i think everything's going to be okay Mm, mm, that's good. That's good, bro. And 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 for me, bro, like like this idea of you know hope that I was trying to deconstruct. I really wanted to like bring hope back to the living, bro. When I read Jesus or when I read the Hebrew Bible, you know, one of the things about hope that I see that they did that they embodied was that hope was not this kind of you know, hey, it's going to get better in the by and by. You know, or there is coming a day, you know, where you're going to be taking from here, you know, and, 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 and everything is going to get better. You know, but oftentimes hope was a practice and a discipline. Hope was a way one showed up in the world despite the worst of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So for me, as I try to think about a theology of hope, you know, or, or, or a, a, a kind of gesturing toward hope as a as a black writer, I wanted to say that the hope is in our living, you know, and wherever we are black and alive, then God is there. 
whatever the whatever we want to say, the stuff of the divine is the stuff of meaning. You know, God is in that. God is in that hope. Um, and, and I'll never forget reading um, Toni Morrison's Beloved and that famous section in Beloved uh, where, where baby Suggs is preaching in the clearing um, to think about the clearing as this space, like within the context of the horror of slavery, of enslavement, that 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 even in the in that place, one could be fully alive and say, love your flesh for this is the prize. Mm. And that was the brilliance of Morrison. That whole sermon, it is a sermon. There is something spiritually grounding about what she, how she wrote that text. Because I think a lot of times, like in, in, in literary analysis, we can kind of distinguish, to, to sometimes to the detriment, uh, the author and the work. Sure. Where, you know, sometimes it's like, yo, what does the text say? What does the text say? What does the text say? What does the character say? That's true. We need to do a close reading of the text and allow the text to speak. But I think we also have to think about Morrison in this moment. Like baby Suggs is not the only preacher. Tony is preaching as well. Like Tony is weaving that sermon within that text. When she's writing paradise, she is preaching with through her characters and she's creating alternative worlds for us as people to be invited into, but also to live and dance and, 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 and grow up in. And so when I think about Tony preaching and baby Suggs preaching and even my book being a sermon, me preaching, trying to preach this, this, this message of, of being black and alive and being black and in love and being black and free and being black and ordinary. I, I think the idea of hope for me was moved away from being able to recall back this doctrine or this dogma uh, and, and do like what Jesus said. When he says the kingdom of heaven is like, he always likened to something that was familiar on earth. And so for me as a as a as a preacher, as a writer, as a minister, uh, as 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 a leader, I want to point in the same ways for hope that that the hope we so deeply look for, the meaning that we look for, we can find it in the ways in which we black folk are alive. And so when I end the book, I think if I'm honest, I think the chapter breath is the most important chapter of my book. You know, like I really felt as a writer and a preacher, I was in my bag in a sense of like, you know, I really thought about people and, and the whole premise of the chapter was on suffocation and breathing and, and the ways in which we're not just suffocated as, as black folk, but like we, we're in a chokehold as humanity and, and, and we're trying to catch our breath again. But then in the end, as I like turn to like this young, beautiful brilliant ordinary young black sister i say that's where my hope lie it's in the way we show up it's in the way we don't give up on one another yeah i want people to know what you're referring to here can i sorry to interrupt yeah, i just want people to know for sure so basically you're you're scrolling through photos from the protests that were happening yep. after george floyd was murdered mm -hmm. and you see this girl on your computer screen and you, you refer to her she say there's a beautiful black baby girl her piercing eyes full of fear rage love exhaustion and as you're looking at this you see strength there you know the the crowd around her is chanting no justice no peace mm -hmm. and when you're looking at that you said at that moment i'd become sad i'd Fair. become sad because i knew that no child should have to use her lungs to scream to live mm -hmm. and for those who look like her to breathe. But then you say, then I remembered that was the hope. That was Thanks. the hope. Her black body caught between danger and deliverance. And she kind of becomes a living gospel to you. Oh, 100%. 100%. And I, and I think, you know, and I get this from Jason Reynolds, like taking the lives of young people seriously as how we think about the world. And, and she lives in the tension. She lives in reality. Like no child should have to go in the street to declare that our lives matter, but she is there. And because she is there, we have to account for that. And we have to make meaning out of it. We don't make her whatever we want to make her for she is human being. And, and, and she gets to create her own meaning. But we writers, what we do is we take the stuff of life and as Toni Morrison said, we try to translate sorrow into meaning. So when I think about this young girl, I see love, hurt, pain, but 
audacity, like black audacity to say, I'm going to shout and march and scream for you. <laughs> You're gone, but I'm still here and remain. And I think about our future and I think about black futures and black futures and hope are wrapped up in one another. And it's all wrapped up in the ways in which we show up, but also imagine what life can be for ourselves. Not just right now, but tomorrow, the next day after that and generations to come. Hmm. That's Dante Stewart. He's author of the new book, Shouting in the Fire, an American Epistle. He earned his bachelor's degree in sociology at Clemson. He's currently studying at Chandler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. All right, we're going to take it just a quick break and come back for one more question. It's our best book segment. This is when you get to recommend something to everybody. In addition, I, you know, I'm recommending Shouting in the Fire. Let's see what else you've got for us. So we'll be right back with Dante Stewart. Hey, this is Blair Hodges, and we're taking a little break here to talk about reviews, uh, reviews that come in. It's really great to get reviews in Apple Podcasts. And this one came from C. Watts, uh, who says, be Hodge for life. Well, uh, thank you. That should be our new tagline for the show. Uh, C. Watts says, it's tough to believe that this show is technically a side project. Blair always delivers a meaty interview that also somehow feels like a casual conversation. I find myself thinking back on each episode as I wait for the next drop become a fire cider today well thank you c watts for doing that thanks for sending in that review i always love reading these reviews it's really gratifying and i appreciate everybody who takes the time to do that you can do that in apple podcasts you can also leave a comment on the website uh, each episode has a comment section it's not very highly trafficked you're not going to run into a lot of voices there but you know i get a few comments here and there and uh, every little bit of feedback helps. So I appreciate that. Responses on social media as well. You know, anything you can do to interact, it's, it's nice on this side of the microphone to hear from the audience. So leave a rating and a review, leave a comment, something like that. It's a great way to show appreciation. So I'm grateful for everybody who takes the time to do that. All right, let's get back to the interview. We're back with Dante Stewart. Today we talked about his book, Shouting in the Fire, an American Epistle. It's a fantastic book. And uh, Dante, it's great to be here. I really appreciate you doing this. And now it's your turn to recommend something. This is our best book segment. So what have you got for us? What do you want people to check out? Okay, I uh, got to show love to fam. So y'all got to read everything by Kiese. Like, but what I am reading lately, though, is Lone Division. And that joint... I mean, Lone Division got me crying, bro. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just a funny, funny book. Like, it's a good book, a real book. But, like, Kiese wove some humor in there that I like. And, and it's very much like Mateo's book, Black Book. Like, you got to read Black Book by Mateo. You got to read The Prophets by Robert Jones. You got to read um, Secret Lies of Church Lady by Disha. Feel y'all. You got to read. That's on my list. I have oh, not got to that bro, one yet. Like, no, that book is like major, like, like the prophets yeah. and, and secret lies of church lady is just, I mean, they're major, like they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, Kiese recommended the prophets. That was like the one he brought up. Bro, Amazing, amazing book. Um, the love songs of WB Du Bois by Honoré uh, Fanon Jeffers. Uh, the ones who don't say, who say they don't love you uh, by Maurice Carlos Ruffin. What a, oh, also, you know, the New Yorker came out with that anthology of essays, uh, The Matter of Black Lives. Um, and I've been reading like I've been going back in, in, in a day to John Edgar Wyman um, and, and reading a lot of his stuff. Um, and Jason Reynolds. Hmm. Um, oh, ain't burned all the bright. Everybody got to read that. Like, <laughs> Dante, nah, for real, I think hey, that's I think like that 12 joint, recommends, man. man that's I, like I really you're going think, for nah, it. I really think like ain't burned all the bright. Like, <laughs> like I don't read a lot of Jason Reynolds, but like. Like Jason okay. Reynolds is in his bag in that. But then also like, bro, I'm going to say this, these last few books, because um, I I, very, I care very much about people knowing and reading as much black literature as possible. Hmm. People have to read Children of the Night, edited by Gloria Naylor. It's a collection of short stories, the best short stories from 1967 to present. Um, you got to get Baldwin's Collections. Um, from the Library of America. Get any black person collection from the Library of America. I mean, whether you're talking about the boys or the Hurston, 
Baldwin, get their collection. Um, read everything mm. by Tony K. Bambara uh, uh, that she has to offer. Deep Sight and Rescue Missions, The Salt Eaters, uh, Gorilla My Love, The Whole Nine. Um, read Alice Walker's The Color Purple and The Temple of My Familiar. Uh, but then In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. You got to read that joint. Uh, what else? Uh, Maya Angelou's memoirs. Bruh, Maya Angelou's memoirs. Mm. Like, you got to read every single last one. I'm trying to collect them. Like, the <laughs> one I just got, uh, the one I just got by Maya uh, was The Heart of a Woman. Um, I just picked up The Heart of a Woman. But then there's another one uh, somewhere around. It's somewhere around here. Um... <laughs> Yeah, it's somewhere around here. I don't, I don't know where it's at. But then also, got to show love to Imani Perry. Read South to America. Read Breathe. Mm. Read Democracy in Black by Eddie Glaude. Read Begin Again by Eddie Glaude. I mean, it's, yeah, Begin Again. I bro, that it, book, bro, that so book, much. It was incredible. It's so much, and like, yeah, read June Jory. Read Maisha Cherry. Like, read Jasmine Ward. Like. Everything by Jasmine mm. Ward. You got to read everything by Jasmine Ward. But then also read Elizabeth Alexander and Kevin Quashie and get some black theory and black studies and, and things like that. And read mm. Fred Moten uh, 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 and, and read Lewis Gordon. Uh, read uh, 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 Frank Wilderson. Uh, yeah, there's there's just so many books. I'll stop there, though, bro. There's just there's, there's too many. There's no, too I, many, I like too it. Many the books. reason I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because until the past probably six six years or so most of the books I'd read were by white people. Mm. The vast majority of the books that I'd ever read were by white people. Mm. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago when I was looking through, I have a Goodreads account so I can kind of see like all the books I've read, I keep mm. track of. And it was just, man, it really stuck out to me that how, how constrained mm. my personal library had been. And it wasn't until I really started reading all this that I realized how impoverished my reading mm. had been up mm. to that point and how mm. much I had been missing out on. So no, you mentioned I, I a lot of books, it. but frankly, we've got to get more people into the, into the canon of black writers. Oh, 100%. And bro, like, like if any, if, if you don't, if you're connected to social media, any way possible, you need to be on black bookstagram, like black mm. folk doing book work on Instagram, black bookstagram, mm. melanated ready pages galore, uh, Akili and Reggie, so Crystal and, and, and Nia and Reggie, uh, Tracy with the stacks, uh, Cree with Always Black. I mean, I mean, you, you just got so many black bookstagrammers that's just doing beautiful and mm -hmm. incredible work and they are centering black literature and have been doing this for so long. Um, and, and I think, I really think they're the major key to, to so many black books and, and, and black lit. Like hmm. I go there to learn. They're my friends. I love them deeply. I, I am inspired by them as a human being and a writer. I want to read as well as them. I, they just love us so well. And like people need to be on hmm. black, black bookstagram. Like, you know, t forget all my recommendations and go there, go to them. They got the wrecks. <laughs> they, they got the plug. Yeah. What an incredible, t an incredible time to be, to be a black writer and to see, I mean, it's, it's another Renaissance right now. So, Thanks. all right, Dante, thank you so much. And you're, and by the way, you're part of it. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have you as a guest with such a powerful, just a powerful, phenomenal book. And I, and I thank you for writing it. I, I enjoyed it so much. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you having me. And to, to, to those uh, who join you continually week in and week out with every episode, I want to thank you as well. Cause it's not easy you know, to show up um, continually and to support and to continue to engage and, and be there for Blair. And I, and I want to thank you. Mm. I want to encourage you to keep on looking out and keep on sharing, keep on listening, you know, and, 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 and you never know, maybe one of your favorite writers will pop through. Uh, but more than that, Blair is doing actual great work. And I want to thank y'all, the community, uh, for showing up for him. Thank you. Well, I'm talking to one of my favorite writers right now, so thank oh, you very much. Thank you, bro. Appreciate you. Fireside with Blair Hodges is sponsored by the Howard W. Hunter Foundation, supporters of the Mormon Studies Program at Claremont Graduate University in California. It's also supported by the Dialogue Foundation, a proud part of the Dialogue Podcast Network. All right, another episode's in the books. The fire has dimmed, but the discussion continues. Join me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Podfireside. 
And I'm on Facebook as well. You can leave a comment at firesidepod.org. You can also email me questions, comments, or suggestions directly. The address is Blair at firesidepod.org. And please don't forget to rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts if you haven't already. Fireside is recorded, produced, and edited by me, Blair Hodges, in Salt Lake City. Special thanks to my production assistants, Kate Davis and Camille Messick. And also thanks to Christy Franson, Matthew Bowman, and Kristen Ulrich Hodges. The opening theme song is called Great Light by Deep Sea Diver. You can check out that excellent band at thisisdeepseadiver.com. Fireside with Blair Hodges is the place to fan the flames of your curiosity about life, faith, culture, and more. See you next time.